Hi. I want to thank you all for watching my first video. I got over a hundred views and I got subscribers and I've got likes and I'm terribly excited about all of this. So I want to thank everybody for giving it a watch. Um, I also want to apologize for the second one taking so long. Um, there was things that I saw that I wanted to try to do better. Uh, I got a new video camera. I got a new tripod. So hopefully this one will be a little better. There's always going to be progress. So we will see how it goes. Greetings. Thanks for joining me for my second video on our quest to see what life was like in the 18th century. Have you ever thought about how incredibly lucky we are to live in a time where everything is so readily available and easy to get? We run to the store whenever we need anything. We don't have to wait weeks or months to get something by mail or even wait for our favorite food to be in season. We are extremely lucky. We live in an age where we can get just about anything whenever we want or at least in a short amount of time. Today, let's talk about something I'm sure we don't give any thought to at all. So, oh, the lowly white substance that sits on your table in a shaker that is a favorite flavoring to many dishes. Today, we have more salt options than we know what to do with. We have table salt, we have rock salt, we have pickling salt, we have pink Himalayan sea salt each having their own special purpose. A little history first. Scotland has been producing salt since medieval times, but by the 17th century, it was Scotland's third largest export material, only after wool and fish. So why was the seasoning in such high demand, you ask? At this time, its importance wasn't adding flavor to their favorite dinner dishes. It was the basis for the simplest process for preserving meat to survive. You do remember the no electricity thing, right? Which means no refrigerators or freezers to store food in for extended periods of time. They were able to keep foodstuffs in cold areas in their homes for a small bit of time in the winter, but this was left to the mercy of the weather. Since weather can fluctuate greatly, a warm spell could be devastating to their food stores. This was also before canning. Folks needed a way to preserve the fall slaughter or fish for eating in the long, lean, cold months to come. And they were long and lean and cold. So how was this done, you ask? The process starts with a wooden barrel and a layer of salt at the bottom. The meat was then cut up into largest chunks with each piece rubbed in salt and then layered in the barrel with a layer of salt in between. When all the meat was put in the barrel, a brine solution was poured over the meat, covering it entirely, not leaving any open to air. The brine kept the meat moister than just plain old salting. Um, something heavy was then put on top to keep the meat in the brine. When the meat was to be used, it was taken out of the barrel, soaked in fresh water at least a couple of hours, or even overnight to draw as much salt out as possible, and then cooked as usual. So how does that work? Moisture gives bacteria a place to grow, which causes the meat to rot or mold. Salt draws out the moisture in the meat. If using a brine, a salt solution with a concentration of at least 20% salt will kill most bacteria. So how did they know they had enough salt in the brine? It was a very scientific method. What they did was they took a fresh egg and a cup of water with the salt dissolved in it. You had enough salt in your water if your fresh egg floated. One had to make sure it was fresh, like that day as an old egg will float in water without the salt and would not give you a very accurate reading. So you needed a fresh egg and that would tell you how much salt you had in your water and you, you had enough. Salt cured meat and fish was not only used by land dwellers but was the staple of sailors also. No refrigerators on sea ships either. A seafarer's diet consisted mainly of salted meats and fish when they were not to see land for months at a time. Now that we know the reason, let's just touch on the process for a bit. As you might have guessed, the salt procuring business needed to be near the ocean where the salt was. By the 18th century, the modernized techniques involved the salt water being poured into large iron pans, some of which could be as large as 40 feet wide, 27 feet long, and one, inch, or one foot deep. The seawater was then evaporated, mostly by heating the water from underneath by peat which could take eight tons of peat to make one ton of salt. 
but could also be achieved by sun and wind, depending on how big your operation was. As the water evaporated, the salt crystals would be raked out and put in cone-shaped baskets to drain and dry. It is fun to look back in history and see how this all took place, but there are people out there that are trying to bring history back to life. A few adventurous souls are trying to revive these ancient salt industries. The East Newark, hope I said that right, Salt Company near Fife, Scotland, will be starting production soon. Although not in Scotland, the Cornish Sea Salt Company from Cornwall, England has been producing their sea salt for a bit now. A funny story about this is I was watching a British real estate show called Escape to the Country. Uh, the ones where they show the couple three homes that they can choose from in an area of their choice. And they also show a place of interest near the area the couple had picked. One was in Cornwall and featured the Cornish Sea Salt Company, but it did not say the name of the company. I caught a small glimpse of their containers and went on a search. Found it on Amazon and I ordered some. As I was researching for this piece, I found another salt company on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. Websites are down below if you would like to find out more about these salt companies. If you found this thought-provoking and enjoyed our discussion, please like and if you want to join me and find out more about the 18th century please hit subscribe and you will get all the notifications if you are interested in more information clothing and supplies for the 18th century and living there there are links below in the comments and check out my website for a plethora of Scottish history culture and Gallic information <laughs>